So thanks for having me. Uh, we're staying in the supermassive black hole regime, and I'm going to really be focused on sort of billion solar mass black holes for my talk. I'm a very sloppy observational astronomer. I assume that there are supermassive black holes in the centers of most galaxies. Uh, I couldn't prove it even close by Andreas's sort of rigor, but for me, these black holes are at the accretion disks that we find uh, occasionally around these black holes that Charles just told us uh, are a prodigious source of energy that impact the evolution of the surrounding galaxy. So I'm gonna zoom way out for the beginning of my talk uh, and talk about how that energy may or may not couple to the galaxies that these black holes live in in the uh, universe. And then I'm gonna zoom back in and talk about our ongoing searches for subparsec supermassive black hole binary pairs, which we need to find and understand uh, if we're ever to detect gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. So that's my plan. And so I know there's been lots of discussion of uh, the area right around the black hole and the Schwarzschild radius, so I'm really zooming way out, thinking about the uh, the energy that comes from accreting supermassive black holes and how it may or may not impact galaxy evolution. Uh, people who worry about how galaxies grow find themselves really uh, needing the very high binding energies of supermassive black holes, and that's the reason why is summarized here. So what I'm just showing is the mass function that we expect for dark matter halos that comes out of cosmological simulations as compared to the luminosity function or mass function that we observe for galaxies. And what you can see is that there's a really large discrepancy in the number of very massive galaxies compared to the number of very massive dark matter halos. So something is suppressing the efficiency of galaxy formation at very high masses um, and, and Cosmologists have had a, a tremendously hard time stopping big galaxies from growing at late times because there's actually lots of gas in the universe that makes stars. And what they have found themselves invoking time and time again is the energy from accretion onto supermassive black holes. So that's one reason we think that growing black holes uh, play an important role in the, in the growth of galaxies. The other reason is that we observe a ridiculously tight correlation between the mass of the black hole, uh, again, not measured as rigorously as we can for the black hole at the center of our own galaxy, but measured by the dynamics of stars or gas in the centers of relatively nearby galaxies. We can get black hole masses for about 70 uh, relatively nearby supermassive black holes, and we find that they are tightly correlated with macroscopic properties of their, the galaxies that they live in, uh, properties of the entire galaxy potential that have nothing to do with the gravity of the black hole. And so we think we have come up with a variety of stories, but the nice story that astronomers like to tell is that galaxies, in fact, grow by merging with each other in a, a typically gas-rich process the, the, the gas shocks and is funneled to the center. This is perhaps one of the most efficient ways of driving accretion onto supermassive black holes. And as the black hole grows, its limiting luminosity grows as well until it reaches a point where it has enough energy to remove all of the gas from the galaxy. And so you can imagine a sort of balancing act between the growth of the galaxy and the growth of the black hole, where, where wherever new fresh gas supply comes in, the black hole grows until it has just enough mass that it can unbind the, the gas in the galaxy, and this can maintain uh, a relationship as the two components grow. And uh, taking results from Small-scale simulations, like Charles talked about, people do cosmologically motivated simulations of galaxy mergers, and this is now the gas, the red is hot gas being expelled by black holes at the centers of these merging galaxies, uh, done by uh, Ina Choi, who was a graduate student at, at Princeton working with, with Jerry Ostreicher. So it's always nice to 
show these things again so you can see dramatic expulsions of, of hot gas as these two uh, galaxies merge, leaving a, a remnant galaxy with very little gas. So as an observer, of course, the question is, and this, this has, has paid the bills for me for quite some time now, can we actually see observational evidence for this process? And, and one of my favorite objects, uh, uh, this was discovered by Nadia Zakomska as part of her thesis, and we've now done quite a bit of follow-up. You're looking at a Hubble Space Telescope image of the galaxy. I don't know if you can see, there's sort of faint red smudges here. That's the starlight. And here in green is extended gas that extends, you know, five or six times the extent of the galaxy. The accreting black hole lives here, and the pink stuff is some X-ray emission that's coming from, from closer to the black hole. And so this, this extended gas shows kind of beautiful kinematics. You're looking here at a, at a spectrum, so the wavelength is increasing, and this feature here is an oxygen line that's very strong in accreting black holes, and thus is a good probe of the kinematics of the 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas that is uh, what we're seeing in images here in this Hubble Space Telescope image. And so we're seeing uh, both approaching and receding uh, gas moving at about 1,000 kilometers per second, um, and so we're able to determine that a few percent of the bolometric luminosity of this accreting black hole is growing into, going into driving giant bubbles. And we're particularly uh, excited about this object because it has no radio jet. And so whatever process is coupling the accretion energy to the gas on large scales, it's not just being powered uh, by a jet. We have very strong constraints on the star formation in this galaxy. It's not forming stars. And in my business, star formation is one of the largest problems because we know stars form, drive large winds. And so in this particular case, we're pretty sure that we're seeing a giant outflow uh, blown by uh, this accreting supermassive black hole without the assistance of jets. So maybe it's radiation pressure on dust, maybe it's just thermal heating of the gas, but it does seem to be blowing this large wind. Now, that's a, a galaxy that I can study in great detail because it's relatively close to us at a redshift of 0.1. As you probably know, most of the black hole mass density in the universe uh, was built up almost uh, 10 billion years ago. Uh, at redshifts closer to two. So can we see evidence of these outflows uh, if we look back in time when most of the galaxies, most of the stars were forming and most of the black holes were growing? These are n new observations, again, uh, led by Nadia Zakomska and my, uh, my postdoc, Andy Goulding. These are relatively rare accreting, very luminous accreting supermassive black holes, about as luminous as we get so probably powered by billion solar mass black holes. And you're again looking at that same oxygen three line. It's, it's got two components here. But it's so broad that you can't actually see the individual components. These, these uh, gas lines are moving at 2,000 to 5,000 kilometers per second. For reference, the typical velocity dispersion of stars in a galaxy, we're talking about a couple hundred kilometers per second. So this gas is by in no way bound to the black hole. And these are systems that we think are driving just absolutely spectacular outflows, again, in this warm, warm ionized gas. And so just to summarize this part of my talk, uh, cosmologists require the energy from supermassive black holes to be able to reproduce the galaxy luminosity functions that we observe. We are now uh, starting to see evidence in real uh, galaxies for black holes driving outflows with, without the assistance of jets, really from heating from the accretion disk itself. It remains to be seen, I think, because all of these objects that we study are rare, how important Cosmologically speaking, the, the growth of these black holes are. How am I doing on time? Okay, so I ha don't have. Um... Okay, uh, so I just want to spend a few minutes now thinking about what happens after 
the Galaxy merger. I said that mergers are an efficient way of driving gas into uh, central supermassive black holes. We know that mergers happen. We see these beautiful uh, pictures of them from Hubble Space Telescope, and, and we know that supermassive black holes are ubiquitous in the centers of galaxies, although, again, that's a sloppy observational astronomer's view. What happens when these two black holes sink to the centers of their galaxies, uh, and can we observe, uh, will we be able to observe gravitational waves from supermassive black holes? I'm sure you've uh, heard yesterday uh, about stellar mass black hole mergers, which of course the universe is very loud in, in gravitational waves from 30 solar mass black holes, but so far we do not, have not detected the background uh, from merging billion solar mass black holes that we hope to do with pulsar timing rays at, at much lower frequencies. Okay. <laughs> I'll go a little bit slower. <laughs> so I am interested in observationally with electromagnetism helping to constrain the population of subparsec binaries that eventually we hope will get close enough to form gravitational, to make gravitational radiation and then merge. And the embarrassing fact for astronomers is that we don't actually know whether these black holes can get close enough to make gravitational waves and merge. And the problem is that, okay, we know these galaxy mergers happen, and we know that by dynamical friction, the black holes will relatively rapidly, 100 million years, billion years, sink to the centers of their galaxies and form a pair. And they will then be able to get closer by ejecting stars and dissipating their energy and angular momentum. But at some point, they're going to run out of stars when they're about a parsec apart, a few light years. And so then the question becomes, do they stall forever, or is some other uh, process able to bring them the factor of 100 closer that they, we need for gravitational radiation to take over? And this is called the final parsec problem, and it's been in the astronomical literature since 1980. So there's lots of ways you can imagine getting the black holes binary to harden. Uh, gas could do it. Um, Stars that are on chaotic orbits could come in and, and continue to allow the black holes to get closer, but from both a theoretical and an observational perspective, we do not yet know whether or not uh, black holes merge in, in reality. We have indirect evidence uh, for tight pairs of black holes from looking at the light profiles of massive galaxies. So this is my favorite supermassive black hole in the galaxy NGC 1600. We think it has a 17 billion solar mass black hole based on the motions of stars at the center. And what you see, I'm showing you the light profiles of a whole bunch of, of massive galaxies. And the ones that um, have the big black holes also show a deficit of light in their centers, which we believe is scoured out by pairs of black holes ejecting stars as the binary tightens. And so we have very indirect evidence for pairs of black, uh, uh, tight pairs of black holes, um, but the question is, do they seal the deal such that we can see gravitational radiation? So there are a, a few observational tricks that I thought I'd talk about quickly. Directly imaging these things, taking a picture of each of them is prohibitive aside from the very, very closest. And this is the best case for a pair of black holes at a seven parsec separation, nowhere near close enough to make gravitational waves. But we can do the standard trick in astronomy of substituting spatial resolution for temporal resolution and look for periodic variability that you might expect if you have a pair of black holes in an accretion disk. The, if the um, secondary may kick the, accretion, the outer accretion disk as it goes around, and so you might expect to see temporal variability. A bunch of people have published um, candidates in this way. Many of them are not holding up with uh, longer time baseline observations. Also, if you take all of the possible black hole binaries identified by this variability signature, you overpredict the gravitational wave background. Um, so probably most of these are not real, I think. 
Uh, people have also looked for velocity shifts in emission lines from these accreting black holes. Um, if you just wait long enough, uh, you, you, you hope to see uh, changes in their velocity, and that's the project that I will talk about uh, in a minute. So you can either look for bizarre lines, which you would imagine to see um, when the uh, black hole is at some extreme in its orbit, but then you have to wait an incredibly long time for these emission lines to change their shape because you're at the, at the largest extent of the orbit. Uh, this is not a graduate student project, so we thought we would uh, try something a little bit different and just take multiple observations of all the accreting black holes that we can find, and the idea being that we should see velocity shifts if, um, if we have a pair of black holes at, say, subparsec separations, um, orbital periods of around 100 years, then we could hope in you know, the sort of decade time baselines that we have to measure observable velocity shifts as one black hole orbits another. And so the punchline here is that we have a few thousand targets. And here on the right, I'm just showing the expected lifetime in this subparsec uh, radius that, that we are sensitive to with my experiment. So if the black holes are being brought together by dissipation in an accretion disk, we expect that they will um, live in our observable window for about 10 to the 6 years. So if we take that time, then we expect a few percent of our objects uh, should be passing through this phase, and we expect um, to see a couple very large velocity shifts in our, in our few thousand objects. Um, and this is work done by Leela Wong, who is going on to a postdoc at, the, um, at CCA in the fall. And so the fact that we detect none is just starting to be suggestive uh, that either our models are wrong and the black holes sweep through this subparsec phase faster than we think, or perhaps that black holes stall and, and never actually reach the subparsec uh, phase that we're sensitive to. And then, of course, there's always the possibility we're at the, at the whim of Mother Nature. We don't understand accreting black holes well enough uh, to use them as a probe of, of black hole binaries. Um, so this is an intriguing result. I think in the next few years, we'll probably be able to get the factors of three or four larger samples that we need to make this a, a really robust result. And if it turns out that we're not finding these binaries, I think that could be pretty exciting. I'll stop there. Hi. Uh, very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, just a comment on the first point there. Is, yeah. uh, we and uh, Alberto Cesano's group had uh, papers around the same time recently where we said that one is very hard, because if you actually stall the binaries, uh, even in the, the worst case scenario, you just stall them, yeah. the next mergers come in, and then you have interaction with the third black hole and the fourth, and you end up actually merging them. Uh, you inject half of them, and the other half ends up merging. So I don't think you can avoid the mergers by stalling. I, I hope you're right. Scott Tremaine has this fuzzy dark matter picture in which the black holes actually stall at 100 parsecs, which I would think we could rule out observationally, but maybe not. So anyway, I hope you're right. I want you to go through the numbers a little bit. You yeah. said 10 to the 6 years is yeah. how long it will live in this zone. So and right. then you said a prediction of few percent. Somehow those two numbers don't add up in my mind. So, so first of all, just to be clear yeah. for the astronomers, the assumption that we're making is that we know the size of the broadline region. Okay, and so the experiment only works when you have two independent broadline regions so that you can see them orbiting each other. Okay, and so that's where I have this. Subparsec. I'm really only sensitive to a very small radial range where I have two distinct broadline regions. So that, I think, is where my experiment could completely break down. So that's just background, just so you understand 
subparsec. So then I just take 10 to the 6, and I say if the full lifetime of an AGN is 10 to the 8, that's a percent, okay? And then I'm not going to see all of them because I have to catch them at large radius, so then I have to marginalize over all kinds of orbits, and that's where I get an expectation of one or two. Okay, so it's and 10 that's to the 8 that's, years. Yeah. yeah, that's really assuming circular orbits, so if you make them very eccentric, then things get hairier. If you make the BLR not behave well, things get hairier. So that's a really simplistic number, but that's how I get it. Thank you.